Hi everyone, this is Ali John Chaudhry, psychotherapist, and I'm here today with Fern Schubert Chapman. And today we're going to be doing a very important uh, show today on our podcast with regards to the highly sensitive person. Now, this is an interesting topic that's been coming up more now for some of our viewers because of the fact that, you know, uh, HSPs, as they're called, you know, tend to have a heightened intensity. Uh, they tend to react strongly on an emotional level and display uh, elevated uh, forms of empathy uh, that uh, can usually uh, cause, uh, unfortunately, some distress in some cases. And oftentimes, uh, this can be a challenge for some people in our community. So we thought it was especially important for us to address this in today's episode of Brothers, Sisters, Strangers. So thank you so much for being here, Fern. It's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, it's always great to talk about these things. And uh, as I always tell you, I have a story for everything, right? Um, when I was a teenager, my father, who was an accomplished scientist, came up with his own unique name for me. And the word he assigned to me was sensomorph. Sensomorph, in his mind, meant an organism that absorbs all pain. I would say I was highly empathetic, but um, I think he had a point and I certainly reflected on some of it. And I would say over the years, I am no longer a sensomorph because I've achieved a level of maturity and balance, but um, the label is interesting and probably applies to the highly sensitive person. I like that word actually, sensomorph. That's really, really good. <laughs> You know, yeah. I think it addresses a lot of what we uh, tend to see in, in the community in terms of certain people and in terms of how they talk about how sibling estrangement affects them in that way. You know, because, you know, HSPs tend to navigate the world with a central nervous system. And it's very much like a fine-tuned instrument because it captures every note, every nuance of the symphony of existence. And it's not just a heightened awareness of the big things. Uh, it's a heightened perception of everything, the physical, the emotional, the environmental, and the social, too. Right. They are the people who really read the room and pick <laughs> up the nuances and often personalize it. Absolutely. Right. And this is an interesting term. Highly sensitive person was a term that was coined by uh, trailblazing psychologist Elaine Aaron. And uh, she came up with this in the mid-90s. And uh, what's interesting with this is that this concept has grown progressively, kind of like a whisper in a crowded room where it started off as a hushed secret that was shared more and more until people resonated with it in terms of its complexity. And, you know, uh, Aaron's uh, theory spins the tale of a significant subgroup within the human tapestry, you know, and you and I were talking just before the video about how it's like being an emotional sponge, you know, where you, you, you soak up the feelings and the reactions of uh, others with vividness. And, uh, and, and in that sense, you know, it creates that sense of emotional sensitivity that is usually dialed up a lot more, you know, like an 11 out of 10 in terms of reacting to life stimuli, which is really what sets them apart, right? Right. I mean, a lot of it, sadly, is rooted in trauma. And I was just sharing with you that high sensitivity actually exists in at least 100 other species aside from humans. And the research suggests that high sensitivity is actually an evolutionary trait that increases the likelihood of survival because these HSPs are always on the lookout for the potential predator or the dangerous situation. So they're always scanning what's around them and they probably survived more often because they picked up these things quickly. <laughs> I'm laughing because this is so, so poignant in terms of what uh, types of predators we're talking about in the estrangement community, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Well, we've had a few, a, a few of these, uh, examples emerge recently. Absolutely, in terms of narcissists and such, you know, when we're talking about that. And uh, I think that this is something that's really important because, you know, um, HSPs are the type of people that are like emotional uh, alchemists, you know, they'll turn the mundane into the extraordinary, you know, they have the ability to dive deep, you know, and to explore really every ripple, every shadow and every meaning, 
right? So whenever they experience the sense of conflict, you know, it's it's something that usually they they kind of want to shy away from because they don't enjoy the intensity that that brings because of their heightened sensitivity, you know. So it's it's really like a volume knob that's turned way way up, you know, and uh, and, and that's the thing that happens with them. It's like a slight breeze might feel like a gust. A minor ache will be full-blown pain or dim light can be uh, blinding. A soft sound can be deafening. So, you know, it's it's things of that nature within the estrangement community that people will often talk about in terms of the pain that they experience when it comes to uh, that type of alienation with their sibling. So it's actually oversensitivity, but then it leads to overthinking and ruminating. Yeah. And I think you can see that on some of, on the page at times that people are really over-focused on every nuance of what's happened in their experiences. And it's not that, of course, we're there to listen and support each other, but at the same time, we try to give a response that indicates that they need to think about what really matters and are they overthinking this? Absolutely. And we'll get into that shortly, actually, when we get into some of the suggestions and recommendations of what to do, mm -hmm. right? You know, but it's, they're often navigating through thoughts, feelings, and perceptions because they're all interwoven into a thread of a tapestry of sorts, you know? So it's like a kaleidoscopic experience that reveals the shades of existence that most other people don't see or are not necessarily affected by. Because one of the questions we often hear in our community is, well, why is this bothering me as much, right? So right. that's something that's really, really important for us to kind of di dive into, especially, right? And I think it's really important at this moment to say that people are made of different fabric. And each of us may have suffered various traumas, which are not easily compared because what matters is our reactions to those experiences. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And it's it's our experiences that will sometimes shape us and to recognize how we can sometimes be affected by that, you know, according to our own personal baggage and, and how we perceive life as. So, you know, there's there's actually uh, an acronym that explains well what uh, uh, a highly sensitive person is. And it's uh, the, the acronym of DOES, D-O-E-S, you know, so um, well, let's explore some of that and see what that looks like, basically. So the D basically is for depth of processing. And that's something that uh, a lot of HSPs will experience. You know, they'll experience things from uh, 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 all sorts of different angles and have a ripple effect, if you will, on uh, that can affect uh, both themselves and other people, right? And uh, HSPs don't just dip into the toes, uh, dip their toes in the stream of life, but they dive deep, you know, and they contemplate that life's hues and how they personally resonate with them, especially, right? Right. So that's the thing that happens for them. They have a need for depth when it comes to sibling estrangement, you know, and oftentimes that lack of depth can feel like unfinished business, for example, right? right. Mm -hmm. So I just wrote that piece about um, whether you need to discuss your issues when you try to reconcile. And somebody who's an HSP would likely need to discuss it, whereas somebody less sensitive might be able to put it behind them given certain parameters. It's an interesting question, and it does relate back to what I was saying a couple of minutes ago, that we're all made up of uh, different, we're, we're just of different fabrics. And, and I think it's important to recognize that just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean somebody else does. Exactly, exactly. And I did a video just recently, a, a little bit of a, a, a YouTube short video on the fact of uh, fact checking your feelings, especially, which is super important, right? It's not because you experience something vividly that it's necessarily based on fact. So uh, that's that's something that's really, really important in terms of distinguish uh, to distinguish that. So uh, challenge your thoughts. <laughs> Don't believe everything your mind says. <laughs> exactly, right? You know, and so the, the O in, in, in the acronym does uh, now, that's the second one, and that stands for overstimulation. You know, so uh, it's like sensory overload cranked up to the max. Like HSPs are like finely tuned instruments. And they pick up every note, every beat, every rhythm of the world around them, right? But here's the kicker is that it can sometimes become a symphony of chaos, right? And it's like lights might be blaring, noises might be deafening, you know, and they can feel as though they're navigating a maze 
you know, that's just too close for comfort. So they really need to have these moments of recharge uh, and have a, a sanctuary of some sort where they can basically take a break from the world's relentless pace so they can have uh, more of a sense of peace, especially. Almost sounds a little like an introvert. It is. It is when you think about it, right? Because it's, it's, it is kind of a personality trait when you look at it from that vantage point, right? So a person that's a highly sensitive person can be uh, have that type of personality trait. And because of that, with some people that experience sibling estrangement, they can often be seen as a black sheep because they feel things a lot. And when they try to bring this up with some people, they're often given the cold shoulder or somehow not given that satisfaction of going into the depth that they need to to talk about certain things, which is where communication can break down with some people that are resistant to looking inwards, especially like narcissists. Well, and, and where the HSP often becomes the scapegoat. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. They can become the person that gets uh, that gets blamed for everything that's happening in their family, right? Because they don't fight back. You know, they, they, they can adapt in different ways. So that's the thing that's really important to be on the lookout for, right? So now the E in, in DOES, which is the acronym for uh, uh, HSPs, is, uh, stands for Emotional Reactivity and Empathy. So as we were saying, they're emotional chameleons, right? And they can adapt to emotional frequencies around them. Uh, but it's really important that we, we clear up the misconception that they're not always necessarily able to uh, uh, feel other people's emotions as their own, you know? So the, the, there can be varieties of uh, empathy that can happen because of that. And um, they can still nonetheless have the ability to decipher emotional codes, sensing moods, even before words are spoken. And they'd rather, you know, sidestep conflict entirely, you know, just to keep the harmony. So you can imagine that this can create a bit of a sense of a doormat experience where they're going to be dismissive of their own needs. And if this happens over time that either they're dismissive or other people dismiss them, they get they may get a sense of being unimportant. Well, and that whole battle is going on within their head, but not necessarily perceived by those around them. <laughs> so that has its own effect. Exactly, right? So that's the thing that happens. Now, the final letter is S in the DOES acronym for highly sensitive uh, people. So that means sensing the subtle. So uh, HSPs can step into the role of the invisible observer. So they can, they can basically just pick up on moods and the, the tiniest shifts uh, in an emotional situation. So if somebody's upset, for example, they can pick up on it before somebody starts to cry, for example. Uh, and they can, as we said, highly adapt to certain situations to make other people feel more comfortable, you know? And it's, it's kind of like a dance to the rhythm of other people in terms of how they can be when it comes to that. And well, there's, there's a danger in that too, which is you can then assume the emotional regulator role. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of what we, where I was going with this, you know, in the sense that this is kind of what happens is that they can take on another person's problem and somehow put pressure on themselves to fix things or experience a sense of powerlessness when they suddenly can't, right? So yeah, right? So that's the thing that can happen. And we know what happens with people that tend to overthink things in our community, right? So it's so, also important. Yeah, I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, am I a sense of morph? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, taken me a long time to get out of that emotional regulator role and so I would argue that I am not a sense of work, but I certainly was using that capacity to regulate other people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you're using that filter in that sense, right? You're going through that filter if you're not careful. And, and that can be the, the, the danger part is to try to essentially uh, fix things or fix situations or try to fix people in that way that don't really want fixing, right? Or <laughs> So that's the thing that happens, I think, a lot, a lot of times. So, so let's talk about, you know, uh, what can we do or how does this look in particular to sibling estrangement? Because of the fact that they pick up a lot of what's happening in their environment and such, you know, um, factoring in the fact that a sibling can be belligerent, disagreeable, uh, or uh, exhibiting power grabs, or even engaging in toxic behavior. You can see how a highly sensitive person will shut down or in some cases fawn or merge towards the person that is overbearing, narcissistic and antagonistic at their own expense, 
right? So, so there's a few recommendations that we can make, of course, to help people feel better, right? With regards to this and avoid certain patterns. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's important to make your needs known if that is part of the process for you to find your voice. I think that can be important. Uh, but it's also important to choose to disengage from contentious people who may be uh, seeking uh, conflict, you know, because oftentimes it's, it's the right thing to do to, to try to de-escalate things is to disengage and such. I think it's important to be really intentional. So what do I mean by that? I mean, assess the situation, know what you're getting into, and have a plan for how you're going to handle it. Yeah, that's really, really important, you know. So... I often find that, you know, trying to make people understand, that's another big one too, right? You want to make somebody understand. Chances are they may never understand, right? Yeah. And it's it's really about not letting themselves exhibit that sense of vulnerability, uh, you know, with regards to the wrong people, you know, because if you navigate well in it, that's all fine and good. But if somebody else doesn't, then they're going to basically fight back and they're not going to want to go into that space. I think also that recognizing that your identity doesn't need to depend on, on your sibling as well is another important factor or uh, any other family members for that matter, you know? Uh, know so, who you are, know who you are, know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, I always say adjust according to your capacity, not according to other people's expectations of you, right? So, yeah. And hold on to who you are. <laughs> Exactly. So this goes for gatherings as well. You know, if you favor small group gatherings, uh, that's fine. Go with that. You know, avoid getting to a point of being emotionally overwhelmed if you know that big group gatherings can do that to you, right? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and most important, protect yourself emotionally. Feel an emotion, but recognize that emotional regulation strategies can help to appease one's nervous system. You know, it, they, emotions don't need to completely paralyze you, you know, and interrupting the onset of an emotion especially that's that's not yours you know it can help to free yourself from future rumination patterns right so what that really means is to center yourself and breathe yep. take the time to regroup so that you can handle your situation you know walk into the kitchen and get away from the living room where they're all doing this to you yeah, exactly. Or take a step back and analyze after the fact as well, too, in that way, when you find that you're ruminating or starting to get into certain judgment patterns and self-critical patterns, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, despite what your sibling or family members can say. And you're just wired a certain way through your nervous system, and that causes you to experience emotions in a greater way than others. So that's super, super important, you know, to be able to recognize that. Right. Yeah, and there are other things you can do too, getting out in nature and being moved by beauty. Let that be the overstimulation and that overthink that. <laughs> um, you know, feel when you feel the need for downtime, take it. T step away when you're overly stimulated, exactly what you said. So these are all important aspects. And actually, I think there's one thing I would add, which is it's important to cherish that you have a rich, complex inner life and that you have a need for deep thoughts and you have strong feelings. In a lot of ways, you probably live uh, with, you, you live a richer life because of it. And, and there's a lot to be said for that. I agree. And if you can find other people that are like that, then that's great because you can have a sense of reciprocity with some people that will make you feel heard understood and that just being yourself is okay you know so that's really really important for people to experience that right so right yeah and don't let those facebook posts make you feel bad about yourself because they look like they're just superficially having fun exactly that's right you know and that's the thing too you don't need to judge yourself based on what you see on facebook especially you know so 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 important so that people understand this personality trait and understand that it's 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 something that you can work with and there are certain things you can do to get better at this. And hopefully what we've talked about can be ways in which you can get better at this. So identifying where some of the, your, your fallacies can be in some ways or some of your shortcomings can be in some ways is also a good way to compensate to have more of a balanced view as well when it comes to that. Right. If you have this ability to analyze and think deeply, apply it to yourself and try to become more self-aware. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just looking at the time frame. We're almost out of time. So uh, what would be your number one resource for yourself? Well, I've been working more and more with individual clients on one-on-one -on -one coaching, and that's been very fascinating. And actually, Ali John has given me a lot of ideas for some of the posts that I've been doing for psychologytoday.com. So each is connected. Yeah, absolutely. So very important resource. My number one resource right now is uh, the sibling estrangement uh, workshop that I'm going to be doing. Uh, and uh, that's coming up uh, very shortly as well as in, uh, in September. So if people are interested, of course, they can contact me and see if they'd like to de delve deeper into some strategies that are both uh, cutting edge and experiential that can help them. And that can be long lasting that they can keep for after the workshop and continue to practice uh, for, for this area of sibling estrangement and other areas as well. And plus, we've got the support group coming up as well. So that's, that's going to be starting uh, in the beginning of September. So if people are interested, they can get in touch with me and uh, see what uh, that looks like for them as well, if they'd like to have a, a shared experience of breaking isolation and empowering themselves. So Well, and we have a lot more members on the page. So I'm sure they'd be interested in all of the things we are discussing here. Absolutely. Sibling estrangement, sharing, coping, connecting is very important. And uh, if you want, you can join uh, the conversation on Facebook when it comes to that. So thank you so much for doing this, Fern. I really, really appreciate it. And I very much look forward to, of course, uh, continuing to empower our viewers in just the same way we've done today. Oh, it'll be great. <laughs> Have a great day. You too. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.